welcome to another edition of 10 Count. We're here at Hollywood Smoke in the beautiful city of Santa Monica. I'm Steve Kim, joined by Michael Baca of UCN Live and Michael Montero of Montero Unboxing. We kick things off. We go back to the night of October 17th from the famed Madison Square Garden in New York, where Gennady Golovkin unifies the WBA and IBF middleweight titles by stopping David Lemieux in eight rounds. And on the semi-main, Roman Gonzalez remains undefeated, retaining his WBC flyweight title. Stoppage in nine rounds over the Hawaiian punch, Brian Valoria. Mike, let's get right into this. Uh, Gennady Golovkin dominates David Lemieux. I, I think it's interesting, though. People still have this perception that Gennady Golovkin can actually box. Crazy, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, you know, to me, we saw a, a higher dimension from Gennady Golovkin because he faced his toughest opponent as a pro yet. I, I still think David Lemieux is a top five middleweight, regardless of what some of the H words haters say um, the jab the jab was just like a piston it, and you know Lemieux tried to get inside he just couldn't everything he tried I saw a guy in there in Lemieux trying different things could not get inside the way he has with so many other middleweights out there Golovkin showed angles he showed different dimensions he hasn't needed to show thus far in his career Mike that version of Gennady Golovkin, does any middleweight come close to beating him? No, absolutely not. Um, to think maybe Canelo, but I'm not even sure he's a middleweight. You know, he's asking for the 155 pound catch weight this past week. We don't even know if that fight's going to happen now. And Gennady's kind of left in the, you know, hung out to dry. And as far as who do I think he can beat him at middleweight, 160 pounds, nobody. Yeah, I, I just think to me, the one thing that's interesting about Golovkin, uh, in the past he has really made himself into Mexican style. Which, and then Abel Sanchez has said this guy could be a lot like Julio Cesar Chavez. Mike, I think this version was more of a Costa Zoo version of Gennady Golovkin. It's interesting you say that. I mean, uh, a lot of folks, when Gennady was coming up early on in his pro career, compared him to Costa Zou. And now, since he's got with Abel Sanchez, they're comparing him more to Chavez. He just, he has different dimensions. And I think when we see him in there against top fighters, you know, we've talked about how Gennady played around a little bit with Willie Monroe, and a lot of people thought he was being exposed in that fight. Well, here you go. This is a fight where he stayed defensively responsible, kept that chin tucked, used angles. I loved his inside outside movement with his feet. He just got out of range to avoid those big right hands. Lemieux was swinging for the fences, left him off balance, countered beautifully. It was just a masterclass performance. You know, as soon as Gennady Golovkin landed the first three jabs in the first 30 to 45 seconds, you said to yourself, this is going to be very tough. Because, you know, I was watching the replay of the fight, and the HBO announcer said, one of them said, David Lemieux doesn't have a plan. What is that old saying? Everyone has a plan to get jabbed in the face repeatedly, and he looked yeah. like a Pez dispenser. <laughs> yeah. And every single plan goes right out the window. If you can't stop a jab in boxing, you can't stop anything. Here's the issue, though. Does Gennady Golovkin, Mike, is he in any better place now, given the fact the pay-per-view did reportedly 150000 he's looked upon as even more dangerous? Does this advance his movement going into 2016? Well, I don't think he's going to be back on pay-per-view anytime soon unless he's facing, you know, Canelo or Cotto, which he'll be the mandatory for. Um, maybe he'll be back on HBO uh, probably against Tyriano Johnson or the winner of Andy Lee, Billy Joe Saunders. Um, for the fans, I mean, it's going to be non-pay-per-view if it's not, you know, the big fight, the fight everybody wants. So I, th I think his outlook's still pretty good. He still wants to continue to fight three to four times a year. So, I, I mean, I'm still there watching Gennady Golovkin because he's one of the best fighters to watch. Yeah, and I got to tell you guys, being there that night, uh, regardless of the pay-per-view numbers, and last time I checked, guys, they weren't promising a half million buys. Uh, neither guy was getting 32 million guarantees. So I, I didn't understand the overreaction to what is being reported or being perceived as very low numbers. But, Michael, the electricity in that building that night was really spectacular. I've been at a lot of fights at the Madison Square Garden. It probably rivaled the heyday of one Felix Trinidad. Wow. Yeah. That's saying something. Look, I mean, the pre-sale tickets, I believe that was a record yeah. for MSG. The merchandise sales, that was a record for MSG. It was a complete sellout. Even with the Major League Baseball playoff games, I mean, between New York and Chicago, which nobody could have predicted when they signed this fight, everything else going on in sports, when you look at 
how that card sold at the venue, and then the 150,000 buys, I think it's clear that Gennady is a hit with the diehard fans, yeah. but the casuals aren't tuning in yet. And you talked about three to four fights a year for Gennady. I know, that, I know that's what he wants to do, but now at this point, can he get that? Because he, his pay scale was raised with this fight. Can HBO afford that against guys like Toriano Johnson and even Andy Lee? I'll say one thing about Gennady and, and talking to Tom Loeffler. One thing that Gennady has been more than any other modern day fighter today is reasonable. He does understand if you get XYZ for this fight, the next fight, you might have to take a bit of a haircut. In fact, that's been one of the secrets of his activity is the fact that he does not believe that he necessarily needs to be paid at a certain level every single time out. He makes concessions, right. he makes, which a lot of other fighters don't. Do. You know, and he does have all the belts now. Here's the question. If Gennady Golovkin is forced to take an ultimatum from Canelo or Cotto, either 155 or we're just going to take the belt and dump it in the trash can. If you're Gennady Golovkin, you've made it clear, we're just here to unify the belts. Michael, do you do the Riddick bow and take it out of the trash can and say, I'm adding this to my collection? Well, it's going to be tough to see. I mean, I like, to, I like the fact that Gennady wants to unify the, the division and get an undisputed champion. I think that it kind of sheds a light on what others aren't doing. You know, some guys hold on a belt and they just want to defend it. They don't really care about unifying it when there's questions to be answered. You know, we want to figure out who's the best in each weight class. And Gennady's trying to figure that out for us. Um, as far as the WBC belt, I think, you know, it's, we're going to see. I, I, the report last week from Canelo on the catch weight really kind of dumbed it down for me um, when I really do think Canelo wants to fight Gennady, but we'll was, see. Do you think that was him just kind of poking his chest out saying, you come down to me, I'm the A side? Maybe, and maybe it had to do with the numbers coming out, you know? This is a business, and you know, the one thing, going back technically to Gennady Golovkin and talking to Ray Boom Boom Mancini, who was in there with Alexis Arguello, he said, Steve, that jab, is like Arguello's, and he said it's the best balance that I think I've ever seen on a fighter, at least in modern day. Going to Roman Gonzalez, is he the best fighter in the world pound for pound? I if that I, matters. Yeah, I'm getting sick of these lists, guys, and all the arguments. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yeah, he is. Clearly right now, he's the top guy. Um, I think that I want to see him clean out flyweight the way that Gennady's doing at middleweight. I think a rematch with Juan Francisco Estrada Next year, that unifies three titles. If he can get the Thai fighter that beat Zoshi Ming earlier this year, I'm not Ruen Rung. Okay, <laughs> I was close. If he can get those two fights next year, I mean, that only solidifies that position because he's cleaned out a division and he's already moved up in weight. Then, you know, then he can go up to 115 and continue. I'm going to make a bold statement here. Uh, if you actually look at the overall resume and the fact he's actually moved up in weight, the amount of champions he's fought, I, I actually think the overall breadth of his career, I think, is more complete than Ricardo Lopez. I, I know it sounds like blasphemy, wow. but if you actually look at Lopez's career, most of his career, when he fought on a lot of Don King undercards, he fought at 105 exclusively, and there, it was a very thin division, no pun intended. He was <laughs> not facing a lot of solid guys till the very end, and Rosendo Alvarez at 108 was very solid, but look at the names top to bottom, Mike. I, I do think Chocolatito has a better resume. Yeah, yeah, I mean, he has a case, and his career's not over, so remains to be seen. And like you said, the rematch with Estrada is what I'm looking at. Yeah, and as it relates to Estrada, both guys are seemingly asking for a pretty good chunk of change. That, that fight's going to come down to one thing. Will HBO make the commitment financially to put that up? Because Tom Loeffler's made it very clear, he's the stateside promoter, that if there's a fight that warrants uh, an HBO appearance, He's not going to play the opening act to Gennady Golovkin forever. They are going to have to get a license fee from HBO. They're going to have to find a live gate. And that's going to be the next question. We all love Chocolatito, but in this country, especially on premium cable, guys, can you headline with a flyweight? I think in certain markets. I think here in Los Angeles, uh, Chocolatito has fought in this market now a couple times, yeah. I believe. So you could put that fight on here. Estrada, you know, is Mexican. Um, there's, there's obviously a large Mexican fan contingency here. If you put that with the solid co-feature, I think it sells well at a venue like StubHub here in Los Angeles, and it does a decent rating on HBO. 
I mean, Chocolatito is guaranteed with 250,000, yeah. I think, for a pay-per-view. So to put a fight together with Estrada, you're probably going to have to come out maybe half a million yeah. or so to put that on. It's just what it is. So there it is. That's our edition of 10 Count. This is Steve Kim for Michael Montero and Michael Baca saying till the next round, goodbye, everybody.